What's up everyone? It's Ozzy from Mossex Hardware and this right here is very clearly the Ryzen 7 1800X, AMD's flagship Ryzen processor last year. And this guy is the Ryzen 7 2700X, the $329 replacement for both the 1800X and the 1700X. The question I'd like to answer today is, should you upgrade? For those on the first generation of Ryzen processors, I hope that this video will give you guys a clear cut answer as to whether or not you should upgrade to Ryzen Refresh. And for those of you who are window shopping for a new computer or maybe a platform upgrade, I hope that this will kind of clear a couple of questions that you have as well as to if you should choose the newest generation of Ryzen processors or you should just save a little bit of cash and go for the cheaper first generation models. Now the 2700X is an eight core, 16 threaded, 12 nanometer CPU based on Zen Plus, the node refinement of the original Zen node. It has a 3.7 base clock and a hefty 4.35 single core boost clock and currently retails for $329.99. It replaces the 1800X and 1700X, like I said before, two eight core, 16 threaded, 14 nanometer CPUs that retail for $499 and $399 respectively, but you can currently find them both for around 300 bucks. For the sake of this video, I'm only testing the 1800X since it was the original flagship and because you can overclock the 1700 and the 1700X to the all core turbo clock of the 1800X at 3.7 gigahertz. The 2700X also comes with a gorgeous and ridiculously beefy Wraith prism, essentially a Wraith Max with RGB lights around its ring. Considering a cooler of this level comes bundled with the 2700X at such a cheap price, I'm very impressed. You can overclock the 2700X on the Wraith prism, which I will get into a little bit later, though I recommend an aftermarket cooler or liquid cooling solution if you're really serious about overclocking. As far as Ryzen 5 chips go, the Ryzen 5 2600X is a six core, 12 threaded, 12 nanometer CPU based on Zen Plus, just like the 2700X. It has a 3.6 base clock and 4.2 single core boost clock and currently retails for $229.99, a hundred bucks cheaper than its Ryzen 7 brother. It replaces the Ryzen 5 1600X. The 2700X comes with the non-LED rate spire, which also allows for overclocking, but similar to the 2700X, I recommend picking up something beefier for the best performance. I will also have a dedicated overclocking video for Ryzen 2 for those interested in learning more. Now, as a disclaimer, these are not going to be the only Ryzen 2000 chips available at launch. We also have the Ryzen 7 2700, which is essentially a lower clocked and slightly lower bend 2700X that will retail for $299. And then we have the Ryzen 5 2600, which is a lower clocked and slightly lower bend 2600X that will retail for $199. With new processors also come new motherboards. And so we have the X470 chipset, which is an upgrade from the current highest end mainstream platform chipset, the X370 chipset. Now, you can use any Ryzen 2000 CPU on any AM4 motherboard out there as long as it's running a BIOS that supports it. And most motherboards already have those out, so you can update your BIOS now, pop in one of these chips, and it works just fine. Feature-wise, the X470 chipset offers a few things over the X370 chipset, notably the XFR 2.0 technology, Precision Boost 2.0, totally missed my finger there. And then, <laughs> and then we also have AMD's new storage acceleration program, Store MI. Unfortunately, while I was testing Ryzen 2, Store MI was still in its development stages, so I didn't get a chance to really tinker around with it and see if what AMD claims is true. But I will have a video coming out pretty soon, um, as soon as we get the final, uh, the final release of Store MI. So, be on the lookout for that, but that looks very, very promising. The test system for all of these components include the MSI X470 Gaming AC, the Wraith Prism for the 2700X and 1800X, and the Wraith Spire for the 2600X and 1600X. Since both the 1800X and 1600X don't come with their own coolers, I thought it would be best to keep cooling solutions the same across the board and pair them with their respective lineups coolers. I used a dual channel kit of 16 gigs of DDR4 
for memory rated at 3400 MHz. Using the XM profile, I loaded the G-Skill memory at 3400 MHz, rated at 16, 16, 16, 36, and it worked perfectly fine without touching the DRAM voltage. Now with some tweaking, I did get the Ryzen 2 chips to boot with 3600 MHz RAM, and I didn't get the chance to really thoroughly test, so I didn't include my results in this video, but in my overclocking video, I would definitely include that. So stay tuned for that, should be coming up soon. I paired the CPUs with a reference Vega 56, courtesy of AMD, so thanks for that, with 18.3.4 drivers. I tested games at both 1080p to appeal to the masses as most people use that resolution for gaming, and 720p to see performance with less of a CPU bottleneck. Until I can afford one of those dang GTX 1080 Ti's, 720p will have to do in terms of testing games without a GPU bottleneck. NVIDIA, if you're watching this, I'll put my address in the description if you ever just feel feel really generous and want to send me a 1080 Ti, yeah. As far as temperature monitoring goes, I used an open test bench, kept my room between 21.1 and 22.2 degrees Celsius, and used Hardware Info 64 to measure the temperature of the CPU die. And before I go into the benchmark test suite and the benchmarks themselves, I do want to point out that while I was able to overclock the 2700X, I did not yield results that I expected. I overclocked the 2700X to 4.2 gigahertz at 1.4 volts using the stock cooler. Temperatures were a little bit hotter than I wanted to, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But what I wanted to say was, although the 2700X overclock performed better than the stock out of the box 2700X, it also performed worse in some applications. And basically I deduced that this came down to the fact that Precision Boost 2.0 and XFR 2.0, the two new technologies that come with Ryzen 2 and X4, or I guess 400 chipset motherboards, just work really, really well. Basically, turbo core technology and the frequency of your turbo core has become a little bit muddy lately, and that's because modern CPUs are now using algorithms where your turbo core frequency is based on your thermals. In layman's terms, if you have a better cooler, you're gonna get a higher turbo core frequency under the spec of the CPU, of course. And that is exactly what I saw when I was testing. The 2700X has a base clock of 3.7, but it was hardly ever running at 3.7 gigahertz. It was frequently in 4.0 to the 4.1, 4.2-ish range, and often an, an array of cores would jump up to 4.3 and 4.35, which granted that is its rated turbo core, uh, turbo core clock speed, but still. Most of the time out of the box, it's not gonna run at your base clock. So keep that in mind when you see these benchmarks. In terms of CPU benchmarks, it's very clear that the Ryzen 2 series have the lead. Clock for clock, AMD stated there's a 3% IPC bump and they're pretty much spot on. I had a 3% IPC increase going from the 1600X to the 2700X when I locked both processors at 3.7 gigahertz in Cinebench's single threaded benchmark. In the multi-threaded benchmarks, the 2700X and 2600X beat their counterparts with the overclocked 2700X pulling ahead of the stock one by about 6%. The same principles apply in other multi-threaded applications as you can see in the Blender demo. Ryzen 2 also capitalizes on better memory performance as well, with the Ryzen 2 lead in the pack in cached and uncached DRAM read and write benchmarks. While an overclock doesn't help much in the read and write speed, it does provide a 14% latency decrease, a substantial victory in an area where Ryzen did and still struggles. Power consumption is pretty weird because the components are not running at similar voltages or frequencies at stock. Nonetheless, out of the box, Ryzen 2 consumes about 6% more power than its counterparts. Now, if we run the chips at the same frequency and leave the voltage set to auto, the Ryzen 2 chips use 5% less power. A similar story applies to temperatures. Out of the box, the Ryzen 2 CPUs will run hotter because of the XFR 2.0 and Precision Boost 2.0, but at the same frequency, they are significantly cooler than their counterparts. I monitored the voltage when I locked the 1600X and the 2700X at 3.7 gigahertz, and what I found was pretty interesting, but expected. The 2600X had a maximum V-core of 1.188 volts with an average around 1.15 volts. The 1600X, on the other hand, had a 
maximum V core of 1.375 volts with an average around 1.355. So we're looking at potentially up to a 19% increase in efficiency. Gaming displays up to a 15% increase in performance at 720p and 1080p. In 3D Mark, Ryzen 2 pulls out about an 8 to 9% performance increase in the CPU department. At 1080p, the difference between each of the Ryzen 7 and 5's counterparts is around 5% in the games tested. This is mostly due to the frequency difference and video card bottleneck at 1080p. Once we retreat to 720p, the gap widens as the Ryzen 2 chips take a clear lead over the Ryzen 1 counterparts, up to 14% in games such as F1 2017. Overall, the 2700X is 4.4% faster than the 1800X at 1080p using the Vega 56, and the 2600X is 5% faster than the 1600X. Well, based on my data, I do have a few conclusions. First off, XFR 2.0 and the new Precision Boost work very, very well, like I've already stated. The 2700X and 2600X were in the 4.0 GHz range most of the time that I was testing, including in games. And when they were in this range, the V-Core was usually right under 1.4 volts, meaning that 4.0 is going to be a very valid and easy to access frequency for most people if they decide to overclock. I imagine that most Ryzen 2000 chips should be able to hit 4.0 GHz relatively easily with 4.1 to 4.2, 4.25 being the norm with the aftermarket cooling and then 4.3 being uncommon but not a rarity. So while Precision Boost and XFR are awesome technologies and they're working very, very well, they are a double-edged sword, especially for those who want to overclock, because once you are turbo boosting to your limit, your frequency limit of around 4.1 to 4.3, there isn't much room to grow and there isn't much room or reason to overclock. Again, I'm gonna wait until my final overclocking video to come to a strong conclusion, but once you manually overclock, you disable Precision Boost 2.0 and XFR 2.0. So even if you can reach an awesome overclock of 4.2 gigahertz on any of these chips, if you leave it at stock and you have decent cooling, because you will if you're overclocking to 4.2, at least some of the cores are going to boost up to 4.25 on the 1600X and then 4.3 or 4.35 on the 2700X. Did I say 1600X? I meant 2600X. Sorry. So now that the benchmarks are out of the way, let's go to the question at hand. If you're on Ryzen 1 right now, specifically the 1600 or one of the 8 core uh, CPUs, or if you're window shopping for a new PC, should you go to Ryzen 2 instead of Ryzen 1? If you're currently using a Ryzen 7 CPU, then I would not upgrade. If you're on a Ryzen 5 CPU, then I would only upgrade to a Ryzen 7 counterpart because you will get that extra cores, those extra threads, and the slightly better frequency and a bunch of other things that I've already mentioned. If you're on a Ryzen 3 chip, then the world's your oyster. Choose any, <laughs> choose any of these Ryzen 2000 chips, whichever one works best for your budget and your use case. If you're on an older platform, and you want to upgrade and it's starting to show its age or if you're building a brand new computer then I would I would go with Ryzen 2 over Ryzen 1. Price differences between them is pretty small from the 1600 to 2600 it's only about 20 bucks or so 20 to 25 dollars and from the 1600x which doesn't even come with a stock cooler to the 2600x it's also about 20 to 30 bucks so for that amount of cash you get slightly better IPC um, better technology such as XFR 2.0 and Precision Boost 2.0 you get better efficiency you get higher clock speeds um, better memory performance and support um, better latency so you get a, a, a decent amount of things for only 20 to 30 bucks more so I would go for that instead if you know me you know that I am a very cheap person so if you're still on a budget and you can't squeeze out that extra 20 to 30 bucks you still have the original Ryzen series which I'm sure will well they already have been going down in price but I'm sure they'll they'll go down in price a little bit more maybe not officially but through sales you still have those and those are still fantastic CPUs to pick up and because the AM4 platform is going to be supported until 2020 you have at least Ryzen 3 to look forward to all right so that's pretty much it for Ryzen 2000 
listen guys, I really hope you guys found this video useful. Uh, I had a lot of fun um, actually benchmarking this, even though I did come across a few issues, um, kind of like the overclocking thing, which I still have to test that. I'm still gonna test that to see what's, what's really up with that. But, and I'm looking over there because that's where my test bench is right now. But hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If you loved it, then leave a like and subscribe and all of that stuff. Um, be sure to check out my Discord server if you have any questions. I have a great community and they will be more than happy to help you guys with any kind of build questions that you have. Make sure you follow me on Twitter to get exclusive-ish updates and then follow me or support me on Patreon. It's only a dollar and you get even more exclusive updates. I'm gonna start updating that a lot more. So follow me on there or not follow me, support me on Patreon. Cool. All right, guys, I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.